To have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200 inch box? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. It sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, new episode of Eastman's Elevated here. So not too long ago, I did a podcast tour with the Eastmans, and we went and traveled to a bunch of these different hunting companies and then and then recorded with them. So today's podcast is with Glenn Eberly of Eberly Stock Backpacks. Uh, just a super interesting guy. We we went out and had dinner the night before, and then and when then went the next morning and recorded a podcast. But but just super interesting guy. Um, he's really humble, but but he's accomplished so much and done so much in his life, and so many great stories along the way. Um, and, and he's just a, a true innovator, and he's always thinking of the next things and and how he can improve things, and and uh, just a, a really cool guy, and really enjoyed getting to know him, and, and just a great company. Uh, today's sponsor for the show is Everly Stock Backpacks. So they're just building great packs. I used them for a couple hunts last year. Um, they just pack the weight really well, good hip belt on them. Um, I, I use the mainframe with a, a dry bag on it, which is just a, a touch over four pounds. I'm actually interested in their Blue Widow pack and maybe trying that out this season. Um, but but they just do a great job of designing their packs. They hold up to the abuse us hunters put through them, and, and, and they're just putting out a really good product. So thanks to Everly Stock. Um, as far as Eastman's over there, so um, we've got the 13th issue is out or should be out. Um, I'm recording this a uh, week in advance as I'll be gone to Alaska, but that's a really good issue. Uh, comes out on the digital platform. Um, and, and we're just, um, all us staff writers are constantly working to get out the best information for you guys, whether it's reviews of products and, and we always do super honest reviews of the products and we actually use them before we write up, do a write up about them. Um, and then we're just constantly working on our staff articles to, to give you guys the information to be successful out West. You know, anything that helps us out, we, we share with you guys and, and then also our subscriber stories, and our subscriber stories are getting so good nowadays. Um, I mean, you guys work so hard at, at harvesting nice critters and, and now taking really good photos and, and good writers telling the story that I, I love reading all the subscriber stories in the magazine. Um, guys, guys are just killing some giants every year, and, and we post some of the biggest bulls and bucks and then and then specialty animals in there, you know, sheep, goats, moose, and uh, every once in a while, whitetail, but... Um, it, it, it's just a really great magazine, and I'm just excited to be a part of it. So if you want to subscribe, we're still running the offer. The Elevated 617 will get you both magazines for an entire year for $20. So make sure to check that out. And with that, um, let's get this thing rolling. Um, so Glenn Eberly, uh, Eberly Stock Backpacks, um, we, we ended the podcast with a story. I'm going to start the podcast with a story. It's about 10 minutes long. It'll just give you a good feel for who Glenn Eberly is, and then we'll take a short break and then get into the, the rest of the conversation there. So hope you guys enjoy it. Okay, so I'm here with Glenn Eberly, and, and uh, we just finished up a, a good podcast, uh, really informative about Eberly uh, Backpacks and, and the company of Eberly Stock. And uh, so we asked Glenn to share a hunting story with us. And uh, so we prefaced you last night to think of a good hunting story. Um, to, so what do you got for us today, Glenn? What have I got for you? I, you know, I do have some good hunting stories. And usually they're private. And so I tell the story to myself. So I'm at there. This is me. I'm sneaking along. It's really cool. <laughs> You're never reading your own story. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know... I'm an over-the-counter hunter in Idaho, and, and I live in a state where I'm blessed to be able to, um, you know, wait until I can look up to the top of the mountains and see snow on them and go, okay, now I'm going to go hunting and go out and buy a license and an elk tag and go. And, and you can't go every place, you know, because there are you know, areas that are draw hunts and other, other people, you know, buy for those. But there are so many great undiscovered places around here. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting, actually. Some of the most untracked hunting I've done is just on the back side of the mountain, uh, you know, uh, uh, the other side of Bogus Basin above Boise. It's a four hour drive from here, <laughs> <laughs> but it's 10 miles line of sight. Um, but you know, there's a lot of road hunters that go up in there, but if you get a mile off the road, uh, you'd be the only person making elk tracks in places like that. And it's kind of fun to find holes where, you know, where you can go. But, but part of the, you know, there are two 
ways of hunting that are, that are my favorite. And so uh, with the backcountry that we have in the center of the state, um, you know, there's a lot of airstrips that you can fly into and, uh, and hunt out of the airstrip or, you know, build a spike camp out of there someplace. And so, um, you know, those are true wilderness hunts. You go into the middle of nowhere and hike off into the wilderness further than the middle of nowhere and, you know, have an adventure. Um, and, and so, uh, then the other way to do that though, is to, uh, I can just pause it here. Oh, you can be right out. Yeah. You'll, you'll, you're going to be right out. Okay. That's Glenn. He's, he's running the company as we're doing the podcast here. We had the truck driver come in, so <laughs> never a dull moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy, good stuff. Anyway. Uh, so the other way you could do it though, is to drive. And there's some roads that sort of you know, thread their way into the edge of the wilderness and you can hike in from there. And, uh, and some of my favorite hunts are that, you know, just to, to, to go out, like I said, wait till it snows and then drive back there where there's more snow and literally wake up in the morning before dawn and head up onto the mountain and walk until you find elk tracks and then start following elk tracks until you find what's at the other end of them. You know, that inevitably <laughs> leads to some really cool moments. Um, cool and, adventure. Yeah, and that's absolutely. what the lower 48 is all about or hunting's all about yeah. is finding those yeah. new spots. Yeah. 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 But my favorite one, you know, when I think back to like the, the elk hunt that was for me, the quintessential elk hunt was uh, the year when the forest was burning, you know, through most of the summer, Idaho was on fire and there was smoke everywhere and all sorts of, you know, the backcountry hunts were closed early on, except for uh, the Chamberlain base, like the southern end of Chamberlain base and where my friend Henry Blagden used to set up a spike camp. He'd, he'd go into Big Creek and then uh, with the horse uh, string, you know, take an elk camp back up into the middle of nowhere. This, uh, and, and I would fly into the airstrip and then hike eight miles south to, to find him in his camp. And it was just amazing. You know, the, the, the kind of thing where you, you, know, you show up in the middle of the wilderness to a you know, the glowing tents. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. So yeah. totally, totally cool. Surreal. Yeah. yeah. And this one year, it was just Henry and I, Henry and I back there, and we were, we were the only two people hunting in Chamberlain Basin because every all the outfitters, you know, shut down because of the fire, the fire restrictions. And so um, it was all smoky around us, but our little, you know, part of the world was untouched. And, 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 and it was just really neat to be in the wilderness by yourself with animals that were, like, bedding down with the stock. <laughs> and I, yeah. Um, and it, and, and so I saw a lot more elk than I normally would on one of those hunts. And I'm not like a trophy hunter. I don't have to shoot the biggest bull to feel more manly about myself. But I, I like to, you know, to realize that the moment you see the first elk is not the moment you have to kill it. You know? Right. And, and so for me, this isn't about killing. It's about the experience. And if I have multiple days, like in this case, I had a week back there, you know, I didn't have to be in a rush to go kill an animal. Um, so, uh, but it was really neat to be in a place where the animals were undisturbed. And so, uh, uh, you know, the opening morning, I was walking out, and, and you know, I, you don't have to wear camouflage to get close to elk. Yeah, <laughs> I was right. this this one time, and and, and I, this was early in the in the pack day, so um, I had my rifle in my back, and I, you know, it's just this really neat feeling when you're, if you're on a gun hunt, um, you get the all your stuff on your back, including your rifle, and you feel organized and agile in a way that you don't feel if, you know, if you're carrying in your hands. And so when it's back there, you know, I'm walking uh, into the woods and I come to a little clearing and I see an elk on the other side of it and I stop and I stand still and and it turns out to be a herd of elk so there's I don't, I don't remember how many but a bunch of cows and a, and a couple small bulls um, feeding through this meadow and I just stood there as they fed through right alongside me you know and people are all like into the, the camo and the scent and the things that make it you know they know that if, if, if I was wearing camo and scent and stuff scent blocker stuff I've done, you know, it really works. Right. But I can tell you that blue jeans and flat shirts also really work. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a lot of things that, 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 that are in the record book that were yeah. killed that way, right? So, I mean, literally, you know, for me to you guys, I've got these elk walking by, and, and I'm just standing there. And when they're not looking at me, I was like, standing there, but I wonder if I could, you know, shoot that bull if I wanted to. So when, when, when nobody was watching, I moved a little bit, moved my left arm a little bit. And I eventually got my arm up onto the butt of the rifle. Nobody's looking. Pulled the rifle out. Sure enough, you know, in standing in the middle of her of elk, I pulled a rifle out of my pack, sighted on an elk, was like, okay, I can, I can shot you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then a little while later, saw another bull that was sort of a, you know, scraggly horn bull and, and uh, decided not to shoot him. Um, and then the next day, I don't think I got into elk. On the third day, um, you know, beautiful bluebird day, crystal clear morning, and I was up at the, I hiked up about three or four miles from camp and I was ahead of this big drainage. And way off in the distance, I heard an elk bugle. And I used to have this really crappy little, uh, you know, whistle bugle that was like the 
pussy bull. You know, <laughs> it's like, my discovery has been if you're the pussy, then the big one comes to kick you out. And that's, not, that's a good way to get, get out. If, you're, you know, if you happen to get him in that ugly moment. So, so, so this is really my favorite hunt. Just in that it was the perfect do it yourself by yourself thing. I'm, I'm there with the pack on my back, gun in the pack. And I hear an elk bugle off in the distance and I bugle and a while later he bugles again. We went through this long, you know, engagement where we walked toward each other and he came off the draw and I came down the drainage. And somewhere in there, um, you know, a, quite a, a, a bit of time later, um, I heard him down below me on the hillside and I was like, okay, he's close. So I get the rifle out of my pack and sneak down around this stand of trees and he's 30 yards from the broadside looking up at me. And it was one of those things where people ask me, you know, are you a gun hunter or a bow hunter? Well, I'm like, yeah, whatever, either one. Uh, but most of the elk I've shot with the rifle i could have shot with a bow yeah. <laughs> right but when you make the rifles and, and especially with our stocks it's really fun for me to shoot one of the rifles that i that i've created and, and so this was one of those you know it was a special gun uh, my wife gave me the metal for my birthday and i made the stock and it was a you know neat gun and a neat moment perfect moment where elk and i had come to each other in the middle of the forest and he's just this beautiful big six point bull you know not the biggest bull in the world but then i 300 something whatever i've never mentioned him, don't care yeah um, but he's the one man i have on my wall and you know that's really knocking cool. him down with one shot you know clean through and on the spot is just you know it's just like the moment where you go this is this is a good out he's a good young bull you know a, 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 probably a three or four year old you know mature six point um not old and nasty tasted great <laughs> <laughs> and, and and again that was before everly stock but it was it was the Everly stock genetics were on my back. You know, I had the thing on the spot to unzip something and open up a new bag and stick a bunch of elk in there. And um, you know, three or four trips out with that pack, and I had him back down to the camp. And that was just, you know, to me, that was like the ultimate. It's the one I remember. Hopefully, elk cool. should be. Yeah. yeah, that's as good as it gets yeah, for sure. Really, yeah, and like I said, he's the one elk I have on the wall, and uh, he's the only one I need to have because when I see him, I think of that whole, you know, the sunshine and the blue skies and the timber and the calling elk. Mm-hmm. But, going across the meadow, everything, yeah. the whole, the whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and so cool the first test with your pack and your gear that you had designed and on your back, yeah. and then to have that moment with that elk and have it all go down. That's yeah, really yeah. neat. Absolutely, and it was, it was it, again. It, it was moments like that. It was things like that that made me go, "Okay, I, I've got something that nobody has. I've got to do this." You know, it just it had, to, it had to come out of my head. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Yeah, very cool. Thanks for sharing, Glenn. Awesome. We sure appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Uh, Really good story by Glenn. I sure appreciate him sharing with us. So I thought I'd just give you a good feel for who Glenn Everly is. And now we'll dive into the podcast. And so you'll deal with another intro from me of setting things up. uh, But then we'll get right into the conversation. All right. Well, I'm here with Guy and Ike. We're on our tour to visit all these factories. And we're here at Everly Stock. And um, just an awesome operation. He's totally rebuilt this factory. And I'm sitting down with Glenn Everly today. Um, which is a super interesting guy. I've really had a good time getting to know you last night and then today. And uh, so thanks for being on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's it's good to have you guys come visit us. It's a long way from Wyoming and Southern Montana. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, And we brought the warm weather with us. Boy, I think it was in the 90s yesterday. So summer's here. Yeah, four on. Yep. Well, Glenn, um, so we we want to get a little bit of background from you, both personal background and then the start of Everly Stock. Sure. Uh, Okay, well... I have a really unique story in the company is, you know, part of that. And so that I think um, is something that I've been reluctant to communicate it through the years because it's a personal story. It's some, and I'm not a person that goes out and, you know, blow smoke about myself. So, so unless you get three beers into me, then I can. <laughs> <laughs> you can't feel right. Yeah. But still, it's, uh, you know, I, I have had a really unique and interesting life. And it's led me to this uh, through a, a, a lot of authentic um Steps. You know, everything that we've done has been self-driven and uh, not necessarily by myself. You know, my wife's been involved in the company from the start and, and totally a skeptic of the whole concept from, from day one and, and challenges me on everything that we do to the degree where it's overwhelming at times. But then I realize, you know, in the course of time, she's made us better than we would have been without her because she's such a critic of, you know, of the whole enterprise, which is not a bad thing. Um, and so... So it's, you know, it's a family business still at this point. Um, I think a lot of people all around us, there are, are contrivances where people try to think of some way to make a living, some way to make money. Um, and, and this really was never that. It was more inspired by the idea that there were 
things not built that could be better. You know, and I, I, I had an eye years ago for um, what wasn't there, this, you know, for this thing that, that, I, that I wished somebody would make. And I go to a sporting goods store as a, as a deer or an elk hunter and look around at the craft that was offered in the 80s <laughs> for, for, uh, for hunting packs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that led me to think that I could do a lot better. Meanwhile, in my personal history, I'd already, you know, kind of cracked the, uh, the can open, I guess, I don't know, for lack of a better way to say it, uh, on this whole design thing. I, I, while I was in college, um, was a biathlete on the U.S. biathlon team, the sport where you ski and shoot. And, mm -hmm. uh, and while doing that, um, you know, at first, like any other kid getting into a new sport, you are grateful to have whatever equipment you have. And, you know, the first time I got a real biathlon rifle, it was really special. Uh, the first ski race in Finland where I fell down and broke a thing in half. <laughs> oh, wow. Broke my heart. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but it turned out that, that breaking rifles in half in that sport in the 80s was a pretty commonplace thing, you know, because the stocks that, um, you know, that housed the metal work uh, were crap. They were just basically, you know, just target rifle stocks cut out of a chunk of some kind of super hard, super heavy, but very brittle, you know, hardwood. And, uh, and they tended to break really easily um, when you fell down. So cross country skiing in the 80s was getting faster, and the faster we went, the harder we fell. <laughs> <laughs> the skis didn't keep up with the speed necessarily. As far as, and you know, I was a great skier, but, uh, but every, everybody would have a crash once in a while. And sometimes you know, you stand up in the middle of the world championship with a rifle broken in half, and the race is over. And so when that happens, um, you know, it was two things. One is I was a poor college kid, so you know, when you're struggling to buy oatmeal and spaghetti. Um, and you're have a four hundred dollar rifle stock break. <laughs> oh <laughs> man! Time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but so so in the course of that, somewhere uh, there was a good woodworking shop at the college, and I went down into the basement of the uh, you know the art building in the wood shop and started cutting on a piece of wood to try to make a, a rifle stock that wouldn't break. Um, and then that led to a really you know meaningful engagement where. Uh, I basically decided that I was going to not, you know, just make a rifle stock that wouldn't break, but I was going to, um, I really investigated how to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and at the same time, in the course of it, I realized that I could make it lighter um, and stronger. And, you know, it, it's easy to say things like that, but the, the interesting thing when you think about it is that, you know, that's a sport where you're standing on skinny skis and, and you know, like the clothing <laughs> and, uh, and it's not a very stable environment for shooting you know and so the premise for target shooting then and really now is that weight you know stabilizes the rifle and, and so you know the premise of that sport was you had to have a heavy gun in order to shoot when you're standing there on cross country DC or land in snow and uh um and i investigated that and discovered that i could shoot better you know the, if i made an ergonomically ergonomically correct uh rifle rifle stock, I could shoot better, and, and, and the weight didn't really matter, uh, and I ended up making a really light stock with the uh, barrel weight forward, you know, being the stabilizing factor, so it, was, it just changes the center of gravity, the center of balance of the thing, and uh, anyway, at the end of the day, I took four pounds off the Olympic triathlon rifle st stock, or off, the, off the rifle, and uh, we went from an 11 and a half pound gun to a 7 and a half pound gun, which is a huge change when you're carrying the thing on your back. And literally, you know, a guy from the Nike uh, Biomechanical Research Lab did a study that uh, demonstrated that you could ski over a minute faster in a 20 kilometer ski race by taking like four pounds off that took off. So the American team suddenly went from middle of the pack to upper part of the pack. You know, and we, I, I took those stocks with the team to the World Championships in 1986, and all these Europeans were looking around at us going, Crap, look at the Americans have. <laughs> and then, you know, the classic comment was, oh, it's a very American thing. And I'm like, you know, you're damn right it is. You know, Americans are innovators. We, we, we do things that are that lead thought and technology and product. And, 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 and so uh, I was kind of proud of that comment from somebody. And then the funny next part of it was that the European governing body, you know, had this, there's all this uproar about the Americans, you know, having this unfair advantage because our rifles were lighter and we were skiing, skiing faster. Um, and they outlawed the stock. They said you can't shoot 
one of these. You can't shoot a rifle that has holes in the, in the stock. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> we went, well, we already have them. You know, you can't let out something we already have. And so, so we fought back and forth and ended up saying, okay, how much that thing weigh? Seven and a half pounds. And they said, okay, so that floor weight became, uh, you know, for, for years people knew it as the Everly Rule. I think now I'm long forgotten, but it still is the floor weight of the Olympic biathlon rifle. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, totally changed the sport um, to, to design that rifle stock. And we were looking at yesterday at some of your designs. You have them up on the wall and kind of the progression of it, each stock that you had built up and through. And then we actually got a sneak peek, too, of that, that rifle stock that was really cool that you produced, too, that you use for your personal guns. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, the, in fact, Everly Stock is called Everly Stock because it used to be called the Everly Stock Company. It was a gun stock company. And um, always on a low burn. I was doing other things with life. Uh, had a had a different career path, let's just say, and uh, somewhere in there um, had you know really out of that thing in, in college where I discovered this design ability that really did impact something. You know, I didn't win an Olympic gold medal, but I did something to that sport that you know all those gold medalists from the '80s are long forgotten. Many of them got their medal stripped from the doping. <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, I can look back with, with a lot of pride and say, I, you know, I competed with absolute integrity. We, we busted our ass and we beat our ass and we shot well and, uh, and, and competed honorably. And, but I left a mark on that sport that nobody else has ever done. So that was really kind of, an, that's my, that's my claim to fame, such as it is. Such as it is. I think uh, that's but, one of your claims. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of other ones. Well, we did. We have, I've done a lot. And, you know, it's funny. I, again, I sometimes, I think, gosh, you know, we should, we should figure out a way to tell people how many things we have originated, how many things we've pioneered. Because I've really, you know, when it, when it came to making uh, packs, uh, the original idea wasn't mine. I, I was in the sport where I carried a rifle on my back. And I'm an elk hunter from Idaho. I'm, you know, used to using my rifle as a brush dart, climbing through the alder brush. <laughs> I'm not like it any more than anybody else ever that's ever done that. <laughs> But, uh, uh, or just the thing of having a rifle on your sling, on a sling over your shoulder all day long, it gets old. So, um, but ultimately, um, you know, the thinking about the different, you know, the sport where you've got your hands, in that case, carrying ski poles, but your hands, the ability to use your hands for anything besides holding onto a gun or stabilizing a rifle or whatever is changes things. And, and, uh, so actually my coach at the time had been a, uh, guy that, uh, uh my college ski coach had been a, uh, a hunter in Alaska, and he said, you know, you should make a pack that carries a rifle so you can use it out of your hands. And, I, and it was just that kind of click in my head. You know, I, I already had the design of books out, and I, and I, you know, drew my first pack in 1987, um, and then came back uh, to Idaho, and with that thing in my head, going, I'm going to make one of those. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, again, back to the crappy stuff in the sporting goods stores in the 80s, uh, you know, it was hard to find a frame that was robust enough to carry elk quarters and more out. And, uh, and I wanted to make a pack that would fit behind my torso. So it's, you know, like the military style Alice pack really is what, you know, the intent of that is that, um, your body, you know, has so much surface area as you're moving through obstacles and stuff. And if the pack is behind you and out of the way and not sticking up someplace, then, um, you, you're less likely to snag something. Mm -hmm. Why cover also so uh so yeah the first packs were made on an alice frame and well other experimental things and you know, i broke a lot of frames back in the day <laughs> <laughs> and, and and discovered also that you know with the alice frame it's a tough pack and people still like them but uh but it's noisy too, you know so when i started thinking about how to go forward with that um, first of all i was just terrified that somebody else was going to come up with these ideas because i had really basic you know conceptual things. A rifle scabbard in a pack that puts the rifle next to your back so you can pull it out where you're wearing the pack. I mean, that's a great innovation in, in, in packs. And, and one of the reasons that nobody had ever done it is not that they hadn't thought of it. Because I had a lot of people go, oh yeah, I, you know, I, I thought about doing that. <laughs> well, a lot of people think about it. Yeah. But making it come off of a sewing machine is a different thing. And so, you know, that process of discovery, figuring out how to make them was a, was a whole other um, evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and now putting out some of the best packs on the market. I know I just um, been super impressed with your pack. It fits me so well, packs the weight so well. I've been using it this past season. 
um, used it to pack out an elk, a deer, a bear. Um, so super impressed. Yeah, I like that frame that you're putting out. And I, I like that you can change it out with different bags and that it's so versatile, you know, in, in its function. Yeah, so you're yep. talking about the mainframe. Yep. And, and it's funny because that device is one that I sort of resisted personally. I mean, I, our, our flagship pack um, is the, we call them, excuse me, the, the J-type packs. And so our flagship pack has been the J34 Just One, and it, it's evolved from the original Just One pack. And I told you guys a story yesterday about going to the buyer of the sportsman's warehouse and with my prototype and you know these these things were coming to market you know will you buy them and the guy you know pulls out his PO book and says yes what's what are you going to call it and I, and I was like well I think I'm going to call it the just one because if you're not just one honey pack this is the one and um, he goes okay that's a good name so we wrote writes that in the PO line <laughs> first time it's ever been written <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, okay, named so, on the spot good feedback <laughs> And then, I, and then the next funny part was again, and, and I was not, I was a pilot. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a, a businessman and everybody thinks, well, how do you come to this business? Well, one way is, you know, just rule of common sense and hard knocks. And that was my way, I guess. So, so the, so the guy, after he says, what's, what's the name of just one? He goes, what's the skew? And I go, what's a skew? <laughs> hey, what? I'm, like, you know, I'm, learning, I'm learning fast. You're telling me what's going on. And Screw so, you too. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it, uh, you know, we laughed and decided to use the J1, and then uh, you know had to have a suffix for the uh, color patterns that we were going to do. And so that so our, our nomenclature, you know, for the SKU list started right there, and the J type packs have continued to, continue to this day. And I'm really proud of them because you know that original idea of a behind your torso profile that's actually you know also collapsed in a way where it rides close to your body, rifle right scabbard for a rifle hunter, so you can pull the rifle out. I mean, it's a, it's a really nice set of features. It's like the ultimate mix and a hunting pack. And honestly, putting them all together in one product is the most efficient way to do it. You know, so if you take one of our J-type packs, it's not the lightest weight thing, but if you build a pack out of a component, you know, set of parts that wasn't built that way from the start, it's going to be heavier. And so when weight's a factor, you know, where we go sort of um, builds from, uh, or, or where, where we go, where we end up, we, we want to kind of what we want to have. So if you want all the features of the J-type pack, that's the way to go. If you want the option to do different things, then you know building from the mainframe, which we were discussing earlier, yep. is pretty cool because mm -hmm. we can build whatever we want. So one of the things that, you know, and, and as I said, I was sort of resistant to the idea because I'm really proud of what the J-packs do, that whole set of features. And, and for you know, non-rifle hunters, we took the rifle scabbard out and we made the Blue Widow, which is a really popular pack and it still has what we call the cannon expansion feature. So you have the primary storage that you know, in two log uh, compartments that uh, part away from each other to open up a large storage space. And that's a really nice, you know, expansion on the spot to carry meat out of the forest or, uh, you know, expansion to carry gear into a spike camp and then collapse down the honey pack to, to work, you know, water day hunting. And that, those, those feature sets are awesome. You know, and, and again, I, I think if there's one thing that we stand for that, we, that symbolizes what we've done in hunting, those are, that mix is really good. So, I obviously thought of, I think, every way to skin this cat, and and uh, and again back to the old pack frame things. I mean, I'd, I'd use classic pack frames, and I like the more compact ones, like the Ellis pack, because of the whole like you know you want to go hunt with a giant, you know, forty inch tall, twenty seven inch wide frame <laughs> frame on your back, <laughs> <laughs> a um, caboose, <laughs> yeah, rattling around, you know. So uh, anyway, so I. But we had people through the years, you know, begging us to make packs on the Alice frame, and uh, particularly in the military. And, and so, and I even heard of guys taking some of our uh, internal frame packs and, and having them retrofitted with Alice frames. And I was like, yeah, are you kidding me? That freaking frame was three and a half pounds at the start, just the metal work on it. And, and so, uh, but, so the idea was in my head that people wanted uh, the option for a, a stiffer frame. Mm -hmm. and, and that, and I, pioneered this thing that we call the Intex frame. So again, it, I, I'm really proud of that evolution because we have, if, if we step all the way back to the start of this, where, uh, as I said, people had thought of the things that I'd done, but not done because it was too, comp too complicated to make it. Well, we figured out ways to make backpacks that were far more complicated and far more parts and steps involved than anybody ever done in any venue for, you know, for backpacks. So we, as a company, demonstrated and, and open a whole new way of doing things in the market that nobody had ever done in any pack market. Um, 
whether it's outdoor or you know construction equipment or military or you name it. We've gone further than first than anybody ever been. Um, and, and in getting there, one of the things that was sort of interesting is you know before we did it, people used to say that the low limit of an internal frame pack was maybe going to be 60 pounds, um, and you know, a really you know robust internal frame pack might be 80 pounds. Um, and there are a lot of guys that are in the market still that are sort of well known that uh, you know I've, I've overheard having a conversation you know with an elk hunter that, that, that they'd say well you know we just don't make something that can support what you do you, you've got to you go find one of those flavor frames to carry that stuff you know and I'm standing there going oh thank God I've got something <laughs> 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 you know because uh, again one of the if you make the pack right um, an internal frame pack can carry an unlimited, you know, you fill with rocks, it'll carry it. And so we used to do that. We demonstrated trade shows, you know, fill our packs with rocks and have guys muscle them around and laugh and <laughs> <laughs> show that they could do it. So, uh, but, you know, if you have a classic internal frame pack that stays in it, um, mm -hmm. it is affected by the load, you know, if, if, if it's, full, say, pea gravel. Yeah. You know, morphs into something that's not quite the shape of your body and you right. deal with it, right? So, um, you know, so that evolution led, us, led me to think about how to make a frame that was um, lightweight, that had the structural uh, integrity of, say, the Alice frame, that you were you know, in, in external frame pack, um, but make it an, into an internal frame type pack. And, and so, you know, our perimeter frames, the Intex 2 system, you pick up one of those frames, they're just they're ounces. They're so cool. They're you know it's this neat, elegant piece of uh, aluminum tubing that is shaped into a ergonomically uh, correct uh, shape to, to go against your back, and that rides inside of our packs in the same way that an internal frame would. Uh, you know, so it's sort of a hybrid system. So we started with that uh, in some of our J-type packs, and uh, and succeeded with it. You know, Tested the water, felt good, and then decided to strip it down to just the frame, and and then have a base to do a modular uh, system with. And we've had the mainframe out now for a few years, and I'm cautious about you know blowing our horn. I don't I don't I don't go around saying yeah this is the best thing ever before it's ever before it's proven itself to be the best thing ever. So. Um, you know, feedback from guys like you who have used them, or Brandon, with his, uh, how, how much weight did he carry out in that one, that one story? Like 115 pounds. Yeah, so and then another guy carried out a full, full elk, which right, right. Was two, stupid. Two guys not recommended. Full bull elk in one <laughs> trip. So, but hearing, hearing that the frame was working that well, and, that, and then we just heard just last week from an Alaskan guy who, you know, is used to the classic giant external frame. If you think about the world those guys live in, you know, super cups, and, and right. uh, you don't need a huge frame to carry a load. You need you need something that, you know, is just bigger than the perimeter contacts of where it's going to contact your body, and then the right geometry to, to load whatever massive thing you want onto that, and really nothing more. And so the main frame is sort of starts with that. It's a minimalist, you know, torso length and a little bit more up for most people uh, system. And, but what's really cool about it, and again, in this past year and talking to people about it, I finally kind of gotten, okay, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise the flag. I'm going to tell people this is the best thing for hunting that you can get. If you want an ultralight, you know, pack, if, if ultralight is your mantra, well, take a mainframe and a, one of our 4,000 inch cubic inch dry bags, and you've got a four and a half pound pack that will carry anything you can carry. That's my setup. <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, because honestly, it, it's cool. Mm -hmm. It's not. You know, a giant top-loading dry bag is not the most fun way to carry your gear because if you want to get something at the bottom, you got to dump everything out. Mm -hmm. But if you accept that, and you just you you will value the efficiency of and the and the and the if you truly you know are a toothbrush cutter and want want the lightest thing that you can carry, but also something that's going to feel good if you have that 120-pound moment that that Mason had, uh, <laughs> then, um, you know, then the mainframe is the ticket. There's nothing like it. And well, you, so, you guys, sorry, you, get, you guys now have uh, adaptions. You get the bat wings that you can you can zip on them, and it kind of makes it a little bit more modular, right? Yeah, and so, again, the, the whole, 
idea is modularity. And, uh, you know, the, so the mainframe has zippers down the side, and that zipper set matches the same, uh, you know, zippers that are that split the JTAC packs. Uh, and so for years now, we've had a system with the JTACs where um, we have duffel bags that you can use to line the mesh meat compartment and put your gear in and it's neat. You, yeah. you, you, you can carry, you know, a, a camp, uh, then you have all your camp and then play camp duffel and right. slip it out and get there or zip it off if you have, you know, a massive load you can mount it externally and zip it to the zipper and then uh, downsize the pack and off you go. So that mainframe uses those same zippers, so all those accessories, the spike camp duffels and the drive bags and stuff that we've made for the day packs, can zip onto the mainframe to make it into, a, you know, a, not just a pack frame, but a pack frame with volume that has a removable load. And, right. and, and then also, then, the cool thing about it is that, uh, you can, you know, if you have an up quarter to move, and you also have your camp on your back, you can displace the uh, the duffel bag and use the, the straps that are attached to the frame to you know, put meat between the duffel bag and the pack frame, and you know, head everything close to your body, and the strap between all the straps, and it works really well too. Well, it, it allows guys to customize their setup to their needs because every different place we hunt and every different hunt is for a different length and in a, a different place in the country or, you know, and so, so it allows guys to customize it to their hunting, which I think is really cool. Right, right, right. And, 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 and again, you know, the fun thing in that, just, just to sort of take what you're saying and, and follow it up with this thought is, um, people always ask when you're a pack maker, well, where do I put my, you know, whatever socks, toothbrush, rain finder? Yeah, <laughs> and I'm like, dude, wherever you want it, your pack, your stuff, you know. But I try to make something that's efficient and and intuitive, so that you know you, you use it as you like it. You become comfortable with it your way, and if, if you you know find two buckles that fit together or snap together, pull the straps tight, you've done something right. You know, it's, you don't have to think hard about it. <laughs> um, so, so with the mainframe, um, it always from the start had you know the vision of being a modular pack system. And, uh, and I can say now, you know, with, with all, you know, with true heart that it works, it's good. And, 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 and the family of products that you can build with it is it's really cool. Like you said, uh, we made this new product that, that way. So they're, they're basically long tubes, which have been proven to be, uh, which, you know, I developed for the J-type packs. And, and at first people go, well, this is kind of weird, you know, this, this long, narrow thing, where do I put my sandwich? Well, you put it wherever you want. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't recommend putting it on the bottom because it would be flat, but whatever yeah. you want to do. Yeah, but so my way of packing those on, the, on a, say, a, a just one or whatever, though, has been to put bulky things in the bottom, like game bags on one side, and, you know, my, my mitten or my, you know, my glove and my uh, watch cap on the other side, and, and then loose stuff can be in the middle, you know, lunch and orange and apple on one side and whatever on the other side, and then, uh, and then some other bulky thing in the top. So you have to sort of stick to six three places in these two where you put things if you have to move money back. And and you know, but the cool thing is there's not enough room in there for things to move around. So as opposed to that four thousand cubic inch uh, dry bag, you know, jumble that we talked about earlier, in this case, <laughs> you know, you just side zip that with the zipper down and go right in there and your sandwich is sitting right where you right. at the start of the day. And, and it's just nice to be organized in a way that doesn't require a lot of parts. And so those those that, that tubular setup is kind of cool. And the Bat wings weren't my idea. Actually, Tanner, who works for us, was like, you know, you should just make these two compartments that'll zip onto the mainframe. It'll work like the J pack. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll try that. Yeah. And then once we got into it, I was like, you know, that was a good idea. You know, and, and, and by gosh, we, we, uh, we made something that now, um, it, you know, and, and I put my own touch on it, honestly. I mean, I, I took the idea, the concept, and I thought, well, you know, not just zipping. If I just, I mean, if I can only zip these on to hold them to the pack, then there are going to be times when that's not what I want because I want to be able to zip something else with those zippers and still carry the bat wings, for example. So I just make um, webbing on the back that you can run straps through so that you can hang them on the compression straps that all of our packs have. Right. Um, so you can mount the compression straps or you can zip them on. And, and, and again, it's a modular component. They're kind of cool because they can swing together, zip together, be compact, and you have that sort of efficient day pack stuff with just enough room behind it to put a rifle scabbard if you're a gun hunter or a hydration carrier if you want that, whatever. You know, so there's a little bit of space between there and the frame. And then if you need more stuff, like you were saying, Brian, you know, you just, uh, what do you want? You, know, you want to add 4,000 cubic inches of minimalist storage, add a dry bag. If you want front loading, add, add one of the spike doubles. Um, if you want a 
really cool setup is the uh, little big top. You know, it's about a, I don't, I don't do numbers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 60, 65 liter pack and, and uh, standalone backpack by itself is beautiful. It's really a nice, efficient, you know, big front loading and top loading pack. It's again, fairly lightweight. You take a harness and belt off of that to reduce the weight further and put it onto a mainframe and have a really cool, you know, hunting pack in itself. And then if you get that moment out there when you've got an out quarter or something to move, um, you zip the, the little big top off and it's buckles and compression straps on the sides made with the compression strap buckles on the mainframe and, and you extend the pack away from the mainframe. You, heavy stuff goes between it and the frame. Cinch it all back together and off we go. I know early when you guys had or started with the mainframe, you had guys saying, oh, I can't keep my meat on it, you know, without it. And uh, it come to find out they weren't using they weren't using meat bags and then actually lashing it on there, right? Yeah, so... Because it has a meat shell. Or yeah. It has a shell. Right. It, you, you know, so in the in my world, I'm, I'm more of an elk hunter now than anything else. If I keep an elk, that's more than that I mean. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's about where I've arrived in life, but, but uh, you know, big things like quarters can go on. Just you know, slap it on, stand, stitch it on, it carries it great, or or you know, elk heads or whatever. Um, but loose meat, if you're you know, again, if you want to carry the most meat and get the most efficiency uh, out of your pack, then carrying bones isn't very smart. Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. Carrying something they're heavy. This card, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> So, you know, I've always been a bone-out advocate, in which case, yeah, meat bags are, are uh, part of the mix. And, you know, we it's been fun. We've not made meat bags because, uh, you know, I, I, I don't really do gimmicks. And so I'm like, you know, you can buy some fine disposable meat bags. It'll work just great, you know, to line our packs if that's what you want to do or, you know, to put on the mainframe. But still, I think uh, there's a reason to make a zip-on, you know, accessory meat bag because it just will be. It's not just that there's other ways to do it, because, yeah, you can go buy a cheap meat bag and stick it on, but the truth is, the integrated solutions are better. You know? right. and, I, and, I, and even though I tend to resist some of those things sometimes, because, frankly, we have a ton of products. I mean, we, I, we have more pack styles and more stuff than I even know about, and I've designed every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was pretty kind of years ago. I don't know how many we make. <laughs> but but um, the... Uh, so, so at some point you go, gosh, I don't need to do another thing, but then you go, actually, no, I should, I should do that. So I, I think we will do this year. I hope to have them by fall, but maybe maybe winter. Yeah, we'll do some uh, meat bag accessories that'll go on with that thing. Cause, cause I know uh, I'm like I'm like Brian. I use the uh, dry bag on the on the mainframe, and uh, Brandon uses he he takes the uh, spike count scalpel so he can unzip it and get stuff at the bottom and yeah. he doesn't have to rearrange everything. I, I, what I do is I take my meat bags and I just compartmentalize stuff inside that dry bag inside the meat bag. So oh, right. I put you know all my survival stuff that I'm never going to get into. Hopefully, it's all at the bottom in one meat bag. And then when you kill something, you just throw them, you dump them all into the yeah. into the dry bag. Use the meat bags and pack it out. That's at that point, right. it's almost done. Yeah, so. it's a minimalist setup, but then yeah. you can keep everything organized yeah. in there. Sure enough, I, I know the food one is this one, and yep. it's actually wrote food on it because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I, you talked about all the webbing. All your packs have webbing throughout, so you can cinch and lash everywhere. And the compression straps and the buckles are designed right to go on there. And, and, and also, the packs are just built with such quality. Uh, we went to your warranty department uh, yesterday, and it was empty with the lights off, nothing in there. But um, so, so you've had to find a way to build these packs with high quality that'll stand up to the abuse us elk hunters and deer hunters will will put these packs through. So that that had to be an evolution over the years, just finding the the right way to do it. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I, I told you guys about the story yesterday, how I got started, and it's, it's just a strange story. It just you know, I did not make backpacks. I didn't know how to sew. But I knew what I wanted, and uh, and I happened to had the good fortune of have a mentor um, in the outdoor market ahead of me, and worked at the North Face. And I called him up and asked him how to, uh, you know, how and where to make backpacks. And he referred me to some people that helped us, you know, the first year facilitate it. But they came from a different world. I mean, honestly, um, the requirements that I set on their table kind of made their eyes go, huh, really? <laughs> so they 
their first answer was to basically make a thing on an Alice frame that looked just like my prototype. And I'm like, no, that's, I don't want this thing. I want this thing I drew right here. So the first design that we made actually um, was part of the process of, of exploring how to take this concept that I had to make a nice commercial product. Um, and we didn't have, you know, again, if you look at one of our J-type packs that are probably the most complex backpacks still on the market, um, there are, are things that I, that I, as a designer, even look at, and I'm like, gosh, I, you know, how did you come up with this? <laughs> because, because to get something like that to come off of a sewing machine, it's it's you know it's origami. It's one fold at a time, one touch at a time, you know, one pass over over a conventional sewing machine at a time. You know, it's not um, some computerized thing like people might think it is, or it's not. And, and again, the, the thing I love about what we're doing is it's not contrived. I mean, everything we try to do is for a purpose and. And so, uh, in our in our you know process process of evolving the designs into something that was tough enough to withstand the torture that it took, um, I learned a lot. I mean, honestly, you know, the first year I went, we went into the market, I was relying upon the language of the suppliers saying, you know, there was a product I won't say its name. I don't think they're in business anymore, but the, the pack cloth made um, in the late '90s, early 2000s when we were starting the commercial line. Um, you know, it had the nice feature of being real soft on the outside and it had sort of a canvasy look on the inside. And it was a nice, you know, looking, feeling pack material. Um, we made packs in the first year of 2003 for the commercial line. Um, and we made them two colors with the same pack fabric. And one of them was real pretty hard to screen, the other one was a Western pattern called Prairie Ghost. And identical product, apparently, but when they came out of the factory, um, Green ones score more easily than the prairie ghost ones. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know if it was from the dye or what, but but you know, just so frustrated to put heart and soul and you know, life blood in something and then have somebody have a bad experience with it, and it just you know it breaks your heart. And so right. from the start, um, you know, my response to that was just you know mortification if somebody had a bad experience with a product. And so when you guys say I use your product and I like that, I'm like, really, you do? <laughs> I'm really honored. I mean, honestly, I, I feel that way. Every time I meet somebody that says they like a product, my response inside is I feel honored. And that's that's my approach to it. Uh, so when somebody has a bad experience, I'm like, oh my God. You know, it's mortification. So the fewer times that happens, the better. And our goal is, you know, what never happen. Of course, the world's not perfect and, and things, you know, do happen. Especially when you can you can make a text a thousand at a time, it's like what you have to do or more that um, you know, somewhere in there there's gonna be an Easter egg, some missed stuff that right. you know, it's gonna happen. But but if, if it happens once in a thousand, that's about the rate that we can tolerate. And so the, the, the truth is now our you know, we do have warranty issues. Oftentimes, you know, it's because people just I mean we have a parallel parallel track where we make packs for the military. We have militaries, armies all over the world that use our stuff and, and they're the tip of the spear, special ops, you know, SEAL team kind of guys and and they're not easy on stuff, but elk hunters are, and deer hunters are just hard. <laughs> hard on stuff is, you know, maybe even worse than your, you know, your average, you know, grunt. <laughs> so it's kind of amazing. But um, uh, you know, so but doing the two together, um, we push the envelope all the time on materials. And so, you know, the pack fabric actually is sort of interesting. I, We've talked about the mainframe, the mainframe plus the dry bag, you know, is the, is the best lightweight system that you're going to get. Um, it's not the quietest one, though, because to make a lightweight pack with, you know, the light, lighter weight cloths really can't have that fuzzy, soft exterior that, uh, you know, the, the traditional hunting pack wants to have or a hunter wants to, wants to stock with a pack on his back. You can still stock with a nylon back on your back, just have to be careful with brushes mm -hmm. against it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Know, right? Yep. So, uh, but, but the, Pack fabric um, that we're using now is something that I developed, and again, it's one of those things that I'm pretty proud of because, um, you know, as, as far as I know, the first company, I'm not as far as I know, I know we're the first company to make a pack cloth that, um, you know, is a laminate that puts the soft stuff together with a, a hard nylon, uh, or, or not hard, but a strong nylon on the backside, and does it in a way where it still remains supple when it's cold and, you know, the thing doesn't get all cracked. And noisy just from the, from the lamination process. So our technique of making pack fabric that we call MT7 is proprietary and it's good. 
and, and what's really good about it is not just that it's quiet, um, but that the way that it allows us to construct packs is uh, that always we have a reinforcing layer of nylon behind the outer fabric that goes right into the seams and then we sew the seams in a way you know, with multiple overlapping um, stitching steps so that the things are very strong. And, and as you saw yesterday, you know, we have now hundreds of thousands of packs out in the world. And, you know, my warranty department is also my pick and pack guy. <laughs> and, he, and he does work in the warranty department, you know, more than about half a day a week. And, and uh, it says a lot. Oh, it, it says a ton. Well, and, and it's uh, the quality of the packs are there. And, and like you say, one in a thousand, most of the time, that's a guy that's not using common sense that snagged it on something or just circumstances that, yeah. that aren't usual for uh, yeah. for pack use. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, you know, honestly, I, 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 t- I my approach is I'm not going to argue with somebody about who broke what. You know, it's not. But, but at the same time, I, I just want people to be honest with us. Yeah. You know, if, if something breaks and, 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 and you know, if you have a problem, like I said, you know, our response is very personal, very, you know, very genuine. We, we, we're really sad by the fact, by the fact, but if, you know, somebody gives you something that was obviously, you know, destroyed by them. <laughs> Just give us the right feedback. So, so we know we'll still fix it, but give us the right feedback. Yeah. 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 Is this to tow your truck? <laughs> anyway, we, we have to do those. And, sort of, and, and again, that's just tough. I mean, but I think people don't understand is, you know, they think, oh, it's just some big company. You know, we'll just, you know, they can eat it. They're not going to know the difference. And yeah, we can eat it, but it's not right. And, 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 and at the same time, um, it's family business. You know, right. it, this is, this is, you know, it is personal. We, we look at everything that goes by us and wonder if we're doing things right or wrong. Or, you know, what's, where's, where's the integrity line on this? Is it, you know, are we in the right place? Um, so, you know, but, but we don't have, we don't have too many of those issues. Most people are good people and our customers we like. And there's a few that come along and just, you know, work on yeah. Family business in Boise, Idaho. You're from Idaho originally, right? Yeah, you know, as a, a little kid, I grew up in Colorado, but then I grew up in the central light of the mountains, uh, you know, from teenagers on, and uh, yeah, this is home for, for sure. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah, it's beautiful driving over. We drove through the Sawtooth yesterday coming over. Um, just beautiful country. Uh, great habitat for deer and elk. And yeah. um, it's really green this time of year. You guys got a bunch of snow this year. I think you said 170% of snowpack in the yeah. local mountains here last yeah. year. Yeah, that yeah. is crazy. Yeah. All those rivers were running. Yeah, yeah. It's really neat. It's a nice time. It's, we're having, now that the sun's finally come out after seven <laughs> months in the clouds, we're having a really neat spring and, uh, and early summer and it's pretty incredible. I mean, the grass growth out here is nuts. There, I mean, the, I've never seen grass grow like it's grown on the mountains right now. And so that translates to really good horn growth on the animals. And actually, last night I was driving home up onto the mountain and uh, walking across the road, nice four point uh, muley in velvet, you know, like five feet from me. <laughs> I, why, did, why did I stop and take a picture? I was going to show, show you guys. And then, and then I look up, you know, into this little drainage, and there's another one that lifts his head up, another, you know, four point and velvet. And wow. I was like, gosh, you know, it's going to Snuck off on him in the land rover, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, <laughs> the sun was going down, really beautiful getting up and going home. But uh, I was like, yeah, it's, I've, I've heard people saying that, that there's a really good year coming just for the, you know, for the health of the animals. It's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of off su- subject from PAX, but um, yeah, you've got uh, your Range Rover, you're really into them. And so the story you told last night was incredible, uh, going and getting this Range Rover that you found that you went up to Canada, made a whole road trip, and then drove it back and had to fix things along the way. Um, what a great adventure. Yeah. So, classic. So, yes, it, it was a classic adventure. And really one of the fun things is, I mean, I'm there all by myself, and I uh, so the story based the, 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 the short version of the story. <laughs> is that there I, is one. Yeah, yeah. I've had a bunch of these uh, old Land Rovers, and I kind of like that. You know, they're the Africa Safari utility looking vehicles, and I don't like them because I, I if 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 I had you know opaque windows and people couldn't see who's inside, I'd be happy because it's not about me. It's about me looking out from this thing. It's not about people knowing what I drive. And so in this case, this thing isn't pretty. The last, the most recent one I had, but it's my favorite one of all. It's an old '84, you know, Series Three Land Rover. But what I like about him for where we live is, you know, south of here, uh, on the other side of the river, there are these great rolling expanses of, of country. And you go out there and, they, you know, it's like the Quines of Wyoming, there's antelope curves in the distance mm-hmm. and, you know, mule deer in the drainages. And, you know, you go out in that, in that country in this thing and it's it's the perfect vehicle for it. But also, it's not just there, you get up into the logging roads back and then, you know, the Idaho wilderness, some of the double track 
lanes up there where you know you don't want a giant you know a dodge truck i, I don't want to take it out to right. those places with this thing you know it, it kind of squeezes through things and i've had some great adventures with those cars but but honestly the best adventure of all was what you're talking about it was just i thought i was done with them i sold the last one and it went for an improbable amount of money on eBay, and I was like, "Oh, we are. I want money, to, you know, to spend on cars now." <laughs> and so, and so I, uh, I, in the course of parting with that one, I'd seen this other one advertised for sale, and it was an '84 Land Rover advertised with 1,500 kilometers on it, which is a thousand miles. And I was like, "There's no freaking way." And I'm sure everybody else who ever saw that ad thought, thought the same thing. But but it stuck in my mind, and I thought, "Oh, I'll call the guy up." So he's a Scotsman, and he's you know on the phone. You can tell he's a good guy. You can tell that. He, person's voice and the way engaged it, 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 or, he's a good human being. So I got that impression and he starts telling me about he, how he bought this thing new from the British Army in two thousand five. It sat for twenty years at that point. Uh, you know, it's a left hand drive and it was in, in, in England prepared for the land war in Europe that never kicked off apparently. It just sat there for twenty years. So it had a thousand miles on it. And I flew out to Ottawa, Ontario, which I wasn't even quite sure where that was, but it's a long way from my home. So I'm standing there going, gosh, uh, well, and, and but fired the thing up and it you know ran, runs like a sewing machine and I was like okay I'm buying this and did <laughs> then I'm in auto going okay now what now what so drive it downtown have a nice dinner and then park in the parking lot of the hotel next morning go out and I'm provisioning for my trip across the border south I, I'm like I'm just gonna try to get to upstate New York and I can ship it from there across America without you know having if I personally imported I would not have to deal with whatever you have to deal with trying to ship it across the border so um, that was my plan. So I'm provisioning at the Walmart uh, across the street from the hotel, and the freaking clutch goes out. And, uh, you know, and I'm like, oh, man, that clutch. How do I, you know, YouTube, of course, helps. <laughs> <laughs> you can build a rocket you on yourself. YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Okay, like, I can bleed a bleed clutch. You know, get turkey baster or some tubing and brake fluid, and it worked. Uh, so then, yeah, that, the first day, though, rolled up the sides on the canvas back of that thing and, uh, and stuck some cotton in my ears and, and uh, you know, so I just had a blast. That, you know, the, it was a beautiful sunny day, and the wind was blowing in off Lake Erie. You know, hard and hell blowing uh, west to east, and uh, um, and I just, but I just had some like a big huge grin on my face, and uh, and I was like, it goes sixty miles an hour, man! Look at this, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and from there, I just decided to keep going, and, and people would, you know, it's a very interesting looking car. So people along the way. I'd have a big grin on my face, and they'd go, what are you doing? And I'd go, or where are you going? And I'd my answer was, west. You know, <laughs> as far as I can get. <laughs> when I get water, I'll be too far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so so the slog across Wyoming, all uphill and against the wind was a tough one. But we made that, and, and then and the downhill to Utah, I was like, woo-hoo! And I was like, we're going to make it, I can tell. <laughs> a four-day road trip, uh, all by myself, and just an absolute treat. And, and really, the, the, the thing I, you know, when you talk about adventure, I mean, I love adventure it, it's part of it's just sort of it, it, you know in a, in a good american man, man's blood right so the right. idea of going off into the woods with a pack on your back and see what happens is you know what our company is all about is really fun and, and, and but it was this was a great reminder that adventure comes in many forms and you know the authenticity of finding something out there some place who knows where and then just getting in and see what happens it was just awesome it was really fun. yeah it's so cool um well, yeah, uh, thanks a bunch, Glenn, for being on and sharing your story with us. Um, you're just building a great pack and a great company. And, and like I say, all of us guys are super impressed with it and uh, uh, excited to see what you come up with in the future here. Well, again, I, I'm honored. Thank you. When I say that, I, the fact that you guys like our stuff, I'm like, you do? Really? <laughs> <laughs> we love your stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that's fun. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Thank all right, guys. That's an episode. Um, really fun getting to meet Glenn Eberly and, and sitting down with him and being able to record a podcast, just a, a super interesting guy and, and really fun to put a face behind the name of, of Eberly Stock Backpacks. Um, Eberly Stock is the sponsor for today's show. Um, they're just building great packs that pack the weight really well and, and just super impressed with everything they're doing there. Um, can't wait to try out some of their newer models and, and, uh, see what's going to fit best for, for backcountry hunting for me. Um, uh, make sure you check out, uh, Eastman's hunting journals. Um, 
We've got both magazines for for twenty dollars if you put in the promo code Elevated Six One Seven. So make sure to check that out. So we got a, a bunch of good issues planned, and I've got a bunch of articles that I'm writing, and I I know our other staff article staff writers are working on articles as well. So make sure to check those out. And and as this is released, um, I should be in Alaska hunting caribou. Just super excited to to be in the bow woods, um, walking around with my bow and arrow. So uh, be pretty fun to to start off the season right and and. Uh, uh, go chase some some big caribou around so um couldn't be more excited uh it starts off with that and get back and a little antelope hunting and and then off to idaho mule deer and and uh keep the season rolling so hopefully you guys got some some good plans for this season got some good hunts coming up and and uh getting some good scouting in and and ready to cut those legs loose because uh it's here and it's upon us uh if if not for you guys yet i'm sure it's it's close to being ready so um Good hunting to all you guys this season. I wish you the best of luck and and, uh, check in with you next week.